Let's begin this morning by just having a word of prayer. Um, I ask God for his guidance and direction in this message. Lord, I just thank you uh, for allowing us to be here. And I pray you just be with me and uh, just help me to deliver what you want me to, to share and say. And, and just to help us as we, we take this message and we look at the story that's here with Moses and we, we dive into it. That we'll, to, we'll look at it, we'll take it and understand what you want us to see. And I pray you just mold us and shape us to be the people that you want us to be. In your wonderful, precious name I pray. Amen. Uh, we're doing, the, of course, the questions, the God Asked book, which I really think it's a good book. And I've enjoyed this fall and, and hearing Mark's messages and, and being able to do a few of these messages. And we've been working on them in life groups. And on Sunday nights, we have a life group unplugged. And uh, just for the fall schedule, we're going to do one more tonight. And then we're going to take a break and probably start back in January. But uh, it's been kind of fun diving into these questions that God asked. And so the question of the day we're actually going to do, we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go to chapter 10, and we're looking at chapter 10 today. And so the question that God asked in chapter 10 is, who made your mouth? And uh, it's an important question. But what we're going to do is we're going to not go with that question starting out. That's going to be our final question. Uh, The first question, actually, we're going to look at Moses and see the questions he asked God before we got to this question. And so we're going to look at those questions because I think it helps us identify with this question. The reason why is because I think a lot of times we have an identity crisis in who we are and who we serve and what we stand for. And I think in these questions, we find the answers that we all have these questions Moses had questions inside himself, and he was reporting these questions to God, wanting God to help clarify to him the answer to the questions. And I think it's the questions that we all have. No matter you're a Christian, an atheist, anybody out there in the world, you have all of these questions inside of you. And we have these questions that we wrestle against, and we're trying to figure out our identity, if and is, is there a God, and, and if there is a God, who is he? And then also, where do I stand? Where, are, where, where do I stand among the population? Where do I stand amongst the, amongst the people? And so I want to go a little bit and, and look at his state of mind uh, before God appears to him in the burning bush. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, we see... The state of Moses, and this is, of course, when he just one day after Moses had grown up, starting in verse 11 here, he went out to where he, his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw the Egyptians beating a Hebrew, one, one of his own people, looking this way and that way and seeing that no one was around. Uh, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one uh, in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? And you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now think about this for a second. Moses had a different lifestyle. He was not a slave. He didn't grow up to be a slave. God had worked it out to where, because they were killing the the new babies that were born, God worked it out and provided a way for for Moses to survive. His mom made a basket. We see those imageries in kids' church, right? With a little basket and it's being put into the water and it's floating down. And Pharaoh's daughter finds it. And she adopts Moses. And it works out great because even his mom is allowed to come and nurse her because his sister spoke up and said, hey, do you want me to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? So it was a great thing that worked out, but Moses really came 
and grew up in a life of privilege. He grew up with the identity in him that he was a privileged person. That God had favored him and maybe, maybe his mom during nursing and maybe people that were Hebrews that knew Moses would let Moses know that he was privileged of God. That God honored him. And then maybe he and himself, he thought he could bring a, a political protest to what was going on in his day of standing up for the slaves. And in his mind, looking and seeing at this Hebrew being victimized by this Philistine, that he could take his own action and his own force and his own strength and take care of that person that was forcing this bondage and this beating that this person was receiving and get rid of him. So when he thought no one was looking around, he killed the man and hid him in the sand. He was doing things his way rather than God's way. He was thinking, I can do this. I can take care. I can be the champion of the Hebrew people. I can represent them and stand for them and they're going to believe me. They're going to trust me. They're going to see some, me as somebody good and great. But what happens is, is that we find out that somebody must have saw, somebody must have heard, somebody must have witnessed, or somebody found the body because he was found out. And then hear him thinking that he is justified and saying, why are you hitting that Hebrew? Why are you fighting with each other? Don't do that. And the one Hebrew that was in the wrong says to him, who made you ruler of us? What we have here is that Moses had an identity crisis. He went from knowing what he knew growing up and who he was made into as being a, a, the daughter of Pharaoh's adopted son, knowing that he was Hebrew, but he came from a privileged life. Now that was all stripped away. Now think about this story for a second, and it's good that we, we don't have the time to really dive into it like we should, but you think about this story of Moses and how he was stripped of everything that he knew. He wandered away from in the wilderness, and he took off, and he found himself alone in Midian, sitting by a well. And we don't have time to go into the whole uh, story here, but we find out later that he is winding up taking care of the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now think about this for a second. He didn't have his own sheep to take care of. He was taking care of sheep of his father-in-law's. Isn't that an identity crisis there? You think about how usually it would be that you would have somebody, that you would offer some things to, to earn that, that ability to earn a wife. You know, you would give things as a, an endowment to say, hey, I, I want your, your daughter to be my wife. Moses didn't have anything to offer. Moses didn't have anything to give. It was Jethro that was, you know, that blessed him to be able to have this uh, marriage. But he didn't have his own things. So there's a identity crisis in Moses of who, I, who am I? Why am I here? And it's an identity crisis that we all can go through. And many times in our lives, we may go through where the, we are identified by our job. We are identified by where we came from. We are identified by who we are with or who we grew up with or our culture. And our identity comes from things that are not just us, but around us. And we see that Moses is stripped of all these things that he was accustomed to. And his life really did change. And he was broken inside. Not knowing who he was or the God who, who he didn't even know or have a relationship. And we'll get into that for a second. But as we see that question up there, Let's go to this, Exodus chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. And now the, the Israel, the, now, and now the cry of Israel has reached me. And this is when he sees the burning bush, and he's taking care of the sheep, and he looks at the burning bush, and he says, I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, so now go. I am sending to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. In verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And verse 12, and God said, I will be with you 
and this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So the, the biggest thing for us to understand or take away from this is that the question is always going to be there. No matter if you're talking to an atheist or somebody that, that doesn't believe in God or an evolutionist, which I believe that when, when you read and look at Egyptians, they were evolutionists. They wanted, to, they wanted to worship creation. They felt like that creation was the power and that they would represent gods, and Egyptians would represent gods as being living creatures, and they would elevate these living creatures as being something more than what they really were. And each one of the plagues that were given were a representation of how God was in control rather than the creation was in control. That the gods that they had elevated in their own minds as being great and powerful were nothing compared to God. They were false and fake gods. Here's the thing, though. Our identity can't come from us. Our identity, and no matter who you are, your identity doesn't come from within you. Your identity is from God. Your identity is knowing God who loves you and who cares about you. And we have to realize my identity is not in who I am because I cannot function without his help. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God creating me, making me, speaking me into existence. And so my identity, you know, we, we try, the world tries to create their own identity. You have a famous musician or a famous uh, actor, they'll try to create an identity that when you look at them, maybe they're the, the person that's the bad guy all the time. They play the bad guy in movies all the time and they have that identity. Or you see a football player, you see this uh, Peyton Manning, and he's, a, he's a, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, and he's, he tries to establish this clean cut, which is good, but that's his identity. One of the greatest quarterbacks in history. But those things can change. Those things in a moment can be destroyed. Right or wrong, looking at Joe Paterno, that that whole situation, you see a man who rose in great esteem, now stripped, taken down, statues taken down of a once great man, and that was his identity, the football coach. See, our true identity comes from a loving God, a loving creator, and the only way we can get back to our real identity is to look to him. Because all these other identities, the identity that Moses thought, I'm the daughter of Pharaoh, I'm privileged. I can stand out and speak up and do things that are different. And people will respect me. His identity wasn't coming from God. It was coming from his own confidence. It was coming from his own abilities and what he felt like God or others had allowed him to be, not God. Moving on and looking at the next point is, who are you? And the question that we ask is that, who is God? Who are you? Is there a creator? Is there, is there a God? You know, I don't know you. You gotta think about it. The, the, even the Hebrew slaves really lost their identity and they didn't know who God was. They didn't know who they were. They just saw themselves as slaves. They didn't see them as being the promised people of the world and that God had made a promise to them. They saw themselves as just being slaves and that mindset was there for, for a long time. And many of them had to die out to get rid of that mindset. Many of them had to spend years in the wilderness dying out so a new generation could be born and raised up to have a different identity because they couldn't understand the concept of change. And so here we have the situation where our identity has to come from God, and then we need to understand who God is. We've got to know who God is. We've got to understand who is this God? What do I need to do? What is my responsibility? And how should I respond to God? And what I love is in this situation is what we see in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. It says this, I want to make sure I just didn't jump ahead, but okay, we're good. Moses said to God, 
Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I, have, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me. What I love about that is that he's establishing that I've had relationships with these people. I've had a relationship with Abraham. I've had a relationship with Jacob who I wrestled with. I've had relationships with these. They know me. They knew me. They continue to know me. But you don't know me. You don't know me like they knew me. Do we know God? Are we seeking to know him? Are we going after him, pursuing him, looking for what he has to offer us? Are we going in pursuit of him? I, that's a burning question and everybody, I, every, I just find it interesting. Here we look at Moses and he's having these questions about who he is and who God is. Who are you? Who, who should I say? I don't even know you, God. I don't even know who you are. It's because there was a relationship. And God is going to begin to work a relationship with Moses. God is going to build a relationship with Moses. And God will reveal himself to Moses over time. So that at the end of the story, as we think about Moses, and we think about him being this great leader... Really, Moses just knows God a lot better than what he did here in the beginning. So looking at this next part in this, it says, who are you? That's the question, right? Who are you? And the next question is, who will believe me? And I think about this in the human, in our human understanding, in our human thinking, in the way we think. These are the things that we ask ourselves. I remember asking these things and when I was a teenager. I was asking these questions in my mind as a teenager. I was asking, who am I? And I was asking, who are you? And then I was asking, who will believe me? Where do I stand amongst the population? Where's the majority at? I want to be on the majority side. I want to be where everybody else is right, where everybody thinks they're right. I don't care if I'm wrong. <laughs> I just want to be with everybody else. I don't want to be alone, right? And that's what Moses is going through. He's going through an identity crisis of who he is, and he doesn't understand who God is. And he's also wanting to know, am I going to have people believe me? Are people going to understand what I'm saying? Are they going to take in what I have to say? And that is an often, oftentimes our questions with God. When God calls us to do something we don't want to do, and I've been there many times, I'm like, God, who's going to believe me that this is a good thing? Who is going to believe that this is a good idea? Is, is anybody going to stand with me, God? Am I going to have to stand out there by myself and say, hey, we should do this? Am I going to have to look like the idiot? Sometimes God says, yeah, you're going to have to look like the idiot. <laughs> and sometimes I could be the idiot. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is that sometimes we hinge way too much on what other people think. A lot of times we allow too many people to influence us in the wrong way because we're more worried about the perception of people than what truth really needs to be there. We're worried about what people may think of us and we're afraid to shout or speak up and stand and take a stand for Jesus. We're afraid that we're going to ruffle feathers. And I, I, I can tell you right now in the things I've experienced in my life and also the word of God that you are. <laughs> you can't help it. They're not always going to believe you. They're not always going to hear and want to take in what you have to say about God. People will reject. People will not follow. But you, you, we've got to do it if we're called. If it's the truth, then it doesn't matter what people think around us. But here's what Moses, God provides Moses. Matthew, in Exodus chapter four, verse one through five, it says, Moses 
answered, What if they do not believe in me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand, a staff? He replied. The Lord said, Throw it down on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. And he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a, into the, into a, the, a staff. This he said to the Lord, Is this is so they might believe that the Lord, the God of, the, of uh, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of ja- Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, he's reestablishing that relationship that he had with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. But here's the thing of it is, is that God was providing him signs and, and helping him to see things. And man, I wish God would do that for me sometimes. I wish I could have a staff and he'd turn it into a snake. And, but here's the thing that I found. There was also, you know, of course, he was able to put his hand in his coat and pull it out. And at one point it was, it was leprosy and then he put it back in and it was healed. And so he could, he could do that. And that's kind of a cool thing. I'd like to do that too, you know, just freak you guys out, right? Um, and then he was able to take a bowl out of, out of the river of Nile and take a, take a bowl of water and take that and just pour it on the ground and it turned to blood. God was being really gracious with Moses saying, here's some things that you can do. And maybe those things were more for Moses to give him confidence. I'm not sure. He did those things in front of people and people did believe. But I will tell you this, not everyone will believe no matter how great things they see in front of them. I've I've seen this, I've witnessed this for myself. Sometimes when people are hit with truth, they can turn a blind eye to what truth is in front of them because they refuse to believe inside of themselves. And no matter what miracles, no matter what things they may see in you and what you do, they may turn a blind eye to it and say, I don't believe it. And that's what people do with miracles all the time. They try to explain them away or they try to to say that, well, that can't be so. The thing of it is, is that it doesn't matter who believes this or not. Moses, at one point, in a later chapter, in chapter 5, he, 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 you know, when, the, the, when Pharaoh gets upset because he tells him to let his people go, and, uh, you know, Moses kind of thought he was going to just be smooth sailing. But God warned him ahead of time that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And, uh, you know, he was expecting that it was just going to be an easy sail. And when the Pharaoh says, uh, make, make bricks without straw, he was like, what are you doing, God? Why aren't you here? Why, aren't this, why isn't this working? And sometimes we can be that with God. We can get frustrated by why he's doing and what he's uh, leading us into. And if we don't see immediate results, we want to give up. We want to just throw in the towel. And I, and I believe that this life verse that I have is, is important for all of us to understand. And it's an important verse in my life that I've carried with me for quite some time now. And it's Galatians 6, 9. Do not become weary in doing good because at the proper time you'll receive a harvest if you do not give up. So many times I think we just want to give up. We, we, when it's hard or difficult for us, we want to call it quits. God was going to continue to work with Moses. He's going to continue to develop Moses. He, he was going to keep his promise to the people. But the thing of it is, is that our way of doing things is not God's ways, you know? It's not God's ways. God's ways are higher than our ways, right? It is. As we move on, look at the last question that Moses asked God. And really, I'm kind of cheating here because it's really not a question. Um, well, I mean, I think it is, but you'll see what I'm saying. In verse 10 in chapter 4, it says this, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since. You have spoken to your servant. I am slow to have speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave uh, human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? 
Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is not I, the Lord. Now go, and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. I want to stop right there for a second. Because the thing of it is, is that basically we ask the question, pardon me. And the reason why it's a question is because he wants to get out of this situation. Pardon is, is a, a, you know, there's a t- couple different definitions of that. Is, is to, you know, think about pardon, you're forgiven of something. Another way we look at the definition of pardon is to, to say, I want to be excused from this. <laughs> I want to be taken out. It's an excuse. Pardon is an excuse. And sometimes when it comes to God, the, the last thing we want is God to just excuse us. And say, well, you don't need to do anything, and it's going to be all right, and, and you don't have to. I'll, I'll, I'll pick somebody else out. It's okay. You don't need to go. And we'll make excuses with God, especially when we've had something traumatic happen in our life. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you're going through a divorce. Hopefully not, but maybe you're going through a divorce. Uh, maybe you're going through some things in your life where your life has changed dramatically and the things that you felt like made you who you were are not there anymore. And you've lost your identity. And you're stuck in the mud. And you feel like you can't get out of the mud. And you're just stuck there and you're like, who am I? Uh, who is God? Why didn't God work this out? Why God, didn't God hear my prayer? Where is he at? Who is he? And then we, we start looking at other people, we're like, well, what about other people? What are they doing? Why do I need to do this? Why do I need to be a part of this, God? Why do I need to follow this way? They don't do that. And then we start giving God excuses why we can't do it. We start giving God excuses. Oh, God, um, it's, just, it's just too hard for me. Oh, oh Lord, I can't do it. Oh, oh, oh Father, I, I just, I can't. Send somebody else. I can't do it for you. We come up and we say, pardon me, your servant. Lord, please send somebody else. I'm not fit. I'm not ready. I can't do it. I can't even get up in the morning. I can barely uh, lead these sheep up the hill. I don't even have sheep. These are my father-in-law's sheep. I can't do this. Who am I? And the Lord gets upset with him. And I'm sure in my life, Lord God, God has been upset with me. And like, Eric... Come on now. Come on now. And if you look in those verses, we see the question of this chapter. We see the question, who made uh, human beings mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? God's response to Moses was this. I'm the one that's created all of this. I, I'm able to do. Don't, don't think it's you. Look at me. Don't think it's within your power to succeed and change your life and, and overcome these obstacles. Don't look within yourself. Look at who I am and understand it's through me that you can do these things. As we continue on and Verse 14, it says, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. Uh, You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to say. He will speak to the people for you, and it is as he be as if... uh, he were your mouth and as if it, you were hit God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the signs with it. You know, I, I can identify with Moses because sometimes when I get up here and I uh, read, I hate it because I, I don't know, I think I have dyslexia because I have such a hard time reading. Um, the words, I see them, but when they get to my brain, it just doesn't come out like in my mouth I feel like Moses, I have flattering lips, you know? I mean, uh, it doesn't come out the way I want it to. But here's the thing, is that no matter what I have inside of me that I feel like doesn't function or work right, or I, I can't do that, God says, but I can. 
God, I can't, I can't do these things. I can't lead people. I, I can't even lead myself. I can. God, I, 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 I don't even know who I am. I know who I am. I know who you are. God is able to do the impossible. And if you think about it, in chapter, in chapter six, he, you know, we're not gonna go to that scripture, but in chapter six, two times he talks to God. And he, again, he goes to the approach, God, I, I can't speak. My words just don't come out right. You know, and during the journey from, from where he left his father-in-law, and you know what? He doesn't even tell his father-in-law where he's gone, really. He tells him where he's gone and where he's headed, but he tells him the reason why he wants to go to Egypt is to check out and see who's left still living, see if any's family's still living. He doesn't even tell his father-in-law God's plan because he's too embarrassed of the plan. You understand what I'm saying? When he, look at it, in chapter uh, five there, if you wanna look at it, go home and check it out. It's really good because he doesn't wanna tell his father-in-law the reason why he's leaving. He doesn't tell him. He establishes that I'm gonna go and just check and see who's there. In fact, in the journey when they were lodging there, God gets so upset with Moses for some reason that he almost kills Moses. And why is that? Some scholars believe it's because he wouldn't perform a circumcision upon his son and his wife had to perform the circumcision herself. But basically, I think Moses was broken. And maybe you're broken. Maybe you've been devastated by some things in your life that have caused you to believe that you're no good. You've lost your identity and who you are, and you don't know who you are now. Because your identity was tied to things of stature or because of a job position or because of a marital status or because of, of things in your life, or maybe you, maybe you even never had an identity even, and you're still struggling, who am I? Our identity has to come from God. And even in the struggle of uh, who am I, we've got to know God. We've got to know who he is, that he's God, he loves us, and he cares for us. And then the other thing is, it doesn't matter who believes you or not. What matters is that God is behind you. And he's right there with you. And the biggest thing, you know, I guess the last thing we go to here, is sometimes we just need a swift, a swift kick in the derriere. <laughs> sometimes we just need a push sometimes we need somebody just to, 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 to make us go because we are so stuck in the mud of despair and feeling like how can I do anything how can I be effective how can I lead how can I be great how can I do great things for God and sometimes God has to push us and get us to where we start believing again and we start trusting again, and we stop giving God excuses, because really, it's just an excuse. It's just an excuse to say, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Send somebody else. Send somebody else. And sometimes God has to just push us to get us to the place that we surrender, and we say, okay. Do you know who you are? Do you know that you've been bought with a price? As we lead to communion, do you know that the price that was paid for you? And how do we know that we got, God loves us? How do we know? What evidence do we know? I mean, beyond the Bible, beyond the gospel, is that Jesus ultimately just laid down his life and he died for us. That in itself should give us value. That in itself should let us know that God cares. Our identity is with him and who he makes us to be. Not in stuff, not in property, not in possessions, not in status. It's him. Whether you're poor or rich, it's him. No matter where you are, it's him. Do you know who God is? Do you have a relationship with Christ? If you're going through a difficulty in your life, the first thing I would encourage you to do is go to God. Get to know him. Get to understand him better. Get, to, get that relationship like Abraham had 
Get that relationship like Jacob had. Get that relationship like Isaac had. Make sure you you focus on that relationship because he knows who you are and you need to know who he is. Don't don't just, don't, you know, I've been in situations like this, we're going to close, but I've been in situations like this where people didn't believe me. Where people were saying things that weren't true about me. And it hurts. It really does hurt. It can cause you to feel like you're no good. Don't put your value by what people think of you. Put your value on the God you serve. Don't look for other people to validate who you are. Look for your validation to come directly from him. The last thing is stop giving excuses. Stop giving every excuse in the book. God's heard it before, and God can still work despite your, infer- your, your inferior complex or the things that you overcome. And I know many of us, uh, there's some that deal with depression. There's some that deal with physical ailments. There's some of us that deal with certain things. But God used Moses, who was 80 years old. So think about this. He had a life crisis in, in his older age. He didn't know who he was. And he was still living from things in the past that he did in Egypt. And he still felt worthless. But God was bringing him out of that. And saying, I want to use you to be my spokesperson. I want to use you to lead the people out of Egypt. So when you think of Moses, we often think about how this strong leader led the people across that Red Sea. But we forget how broken he really was in the beginning and how God molded him and shaped him to be the person he was, God's way rather than Moses' way. So as we close, if you have a need this morning, I invite you to come. We'll have a a communion here, but uh, if you have a need, feel free and come and pray and Mark's going to take over and do the communion. But let's have a word of prayer. Lord, just thank you for everything you do. Just be with us and Lord, Sometimes I feel like I do a good job for you, and then other times I don't. And I'm sure that that's part of this too, Lord, that as me, I need to trust you with my life and allow you to work in me. And even though I don't do things exactly like I would like to do and, and speak as well as sometimes I wish I could, Lord, I know you, you've used me in the past, and you'll continue to use me not because of who I am, but because of who you are. I pray, Lord, that if anybody here is suffering or going through a tough situation, that you'd be with them. And as we take communion, that you would help us to honor you and just value the relationship that we can have with you. And that our identity, Lord, would come directly from you. Be with us now in your wonderful, precious name. Amen.